right, everybody. Thank you all for following along with the History Things podcast Instagram video exclusive of the 156th anniversary of the Battle of Monocacy Junction, the battle that saved Washington. Matt, it's been a lot of fun, man. Thank you for taking us through the, uh, you know, the blistering hot day of July 9th, 1864, the blistering hot day of July 9th, 2020. Because even as the sun's been going down here, it's been pretty brutal. So we've learned a lot in the last few days about um, armies clearing out the Shenandoah Valley, um, crossing into Maryland, making a run on Washington. We've had cavalry clashes yep. uh, and small skirmish engagements on the western side of Frederick. We have had all the eyes from that noise kind of center everything here uh, on Monocacy Junction, a small village just south of Fredericktown. We've had several towns in this area ransomed off for a bunch of money. Hagerstown for 20000 Middletown, they asked for 5 thousand got about twelve hundred dollars correct came to Fredericktown asked for two hundred thousand dollars got the money hmm. banks don't get their money back until 1951 at a tremendous amount of increase or uh, of interest so um, as the battle waged uh, down the Georgetown Pike and shifted over to the Worthington McKitty Ford across the Worthington property and engaged in hot violence across the Thomas farm this is where we left you last time and Lou Willis Lou Wallace rather in command of the federal forces here had ordered a retreat. So that brings us to where we are now at the Gambrel Mill on Monocacy National Battlefield. So Matt, Lou Wallace has just issued these orders to get the hell out of there. So take our listeners to the end of this fight uh, and sort of sort of what's going to come in the following days, because even though the battle here is a one-day contest, the overall story continues for a few days and gets right up on the edge of the National Capitol. Certainly does. Now, when Wallace orders the retreat from Thomas Farm or around the Araby, or Araby Church Road, the old Georgetown Pike, they're going to fall back to the property of the Gambrel Mill, the Gambrel Mill building just off the way here. And they're actually gonna fall back across this open field here. You can see the double line of fences for the trail. This is actually an old road trace. It goes across Bush Creek and eventually all the way up to what is today Route 144, the old Baltimore Pike. Now, federal forces will begin falling back around 5 p.m. A number of them are going to be gobbled up right on this property by advancing and pursuing Confederates. The retreat is going to cause the last defenders of the bridges to fall back at this time. Remember George Davis? We talked about him at the beginning. Well, he's still holding out with about 75 guys from the 10th Vermont Infantry at the railroad bridge. And they're going to begin falling back across the bridge as the rest of the Union line goes. He would later write that his men were being captured by having their coat collars seized. This was how close the Confederate pursuit was. And he would later say that if one more man had to have been taken, it would have been me. That is the worst game of tag you've ever played in your life. <laughs> Absolutely. Got you, POW. <laughs> Andersonville. <laughs> or Danville in this case. Ooh. Now, they are going, or I should say George Davis, will receive the Medal of Honor for his actions here, for getting his men out of here, and for guarding those bridges for as long as he did. In addition, we would have another 10th Vermonter get the Medal of Honor right in these fields behind me. This is actually going to be Alexander Stevens. He is falling back across these fields. Not Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens. Right. Or excuse me, Alexander Scott. Thank you for correcting me. Alexander Scott. Um, <laughs> that could have been really weird. <laughs> it could have been very bad. Uh, Alexander Scott is one of the color bearers of the 10th Vermont. He's falling back across these fields. He is going to see the color sergeant go down. This man has not been hit. He has just collapsed from exhaustion. Remember the heat and humidity? Well, they got another guy. He will go back under fire, scoop up the national colors. So he's now carrying both the national flag and the regimental colors, and he is going to beat feet out of here, saving both of those flags. This reminds me of another Medal of Honor recipient, Alfred Hilton, up in the Aberdeen, sort of Haver de Grace area of north of Baltimore. Similar, he's a member of, I believe, uh, the 4th United States Colored Troops, but mm. very similar uh, reasons for his uh, winning or earning. Earning. Rather, of the uh, forgive me please the earning of the congressional medal of honor he will likewise scoop his uh, regimental colors and the national standards and save them from capture on the field so uh, a lot of bravery uh, rallying around the flags at all times in this war absolutely now these men will fall back eventually to the baltimore pike and then head directly east towards baltimore now they're going to pick up a train around the area of ellicott mills uh, very close to where ellicott city is today and would be moving towards baltimore Lou Wallace is going to send a telegram that night to both um, John Garrett, the president of the BNO Railroad, asking for cars to move his men, the train cars, and he's also going to send one to Henry Halleck, the um, 
first-rate clerk, as he was sometimes referred to, in Washington. Uh, chief of Staff is, is his position at this point. And he would tell him that it's at least 20,000 Confederates, we know that's a slight exaggeration now, heading towards Washington, and that Halleck would need to do everything in his power to protect both Washington and Baltimore. So the situation, though they have slowed early down by a day, is still very, very dire. So a couple things to point out. One, he mentioned that the Union troops were picking up rail cars right around Ellicott Mills, modern day Ellicott City and things like that. What's important is, just for context, if you were to drive down Route 70 from Frederick to roughly uh, Route 40 and Ellicott City, that is about an 35 40 minute drive where you're going almost 70 80 miles an hour the whole time where you're hauling buns these guys are on foot right. they cover a ton of ground in the retreat of a hot and violent day and two um as far as what you just said is is you know with the, the stakes still being high i think that's really important to mention is like right here the urgency of letting henry halleck know that this isn't over right. is is important and then one i always like to take a dig at mcclellan even though you know you know he doesn't always deserve the digs but you know it's funny you made the you know the it's not a, a super big exaggeration what are we saying there's roughly twenty thousand troops here when in reality there's between 12 and 15 okay right. so we're off between like eight five thousand whatever at least it's not mcclellan's you know overestimations of two hundred thousand confederates chasing us down and the Maryland campaign, so at least military intelligence has been getting better. <laughs> Wasn't always McClellan making those exact I know, I just like to point it. So. Regardless, <laughs> the, the federal troops will fall back. The Confederates are actually going to go into camp here. Early would have loved to have pressed on that night, but he has fought an all-day engagement, one he had not anticipated here on July 9th. He is going to order his men into camp. They would rest throughout the evening into the next morning. And at dawn, those Confederates who do not fight here are up and pushing south once more. Those men who did fight here, specifically Gordon's division, are going to be retained until late morning. Even some of them don't leave the area until early afternoon because they're being utilized to tear up the railroad track, to tear up the... Uh, railroad infrastructure that is around Monocacy Junction. These guys bivouac, by the way, on the field of battle. So they are camping for the night, sometimes in proximity, sometimes right near, you know, fields of the dead, their comrades and their foe alike. This delay proves to be beneficially critical to the Union Army, to the Union war efforts, we'll say, because while this battle is a tactical Confederate victory, Jubal Early does win the day. The, con the Union forces have retreated and ceded the initiative and the, the field to Jubal, er Jubal Early's forces. But this, you know, all-day theme of these guys putting up a good fight has been just killing time that, like Matt said, that, that Early wasn't intending on spending here. It, it, men, he's not intending on committing right. to this fight here. And now he did. He spent a lot of time fighting here. He spent a lot of resources of men, you know, energy-wise, in this fight. So his numbers are thinner as a result of the fight, both due to casualties and just these guys are being worn out. So this time has been critical because while earlier in the story we did mention that Washington politics hadn't really been taking this Confederate movement in the valley very seriously. Grant had been getting similar updates on things like that. And like we had said, these reinforcements that were being dispatched to come help Lew Wallace, or I guess Harper's Ferry as it was intended, weren't the only reinforcements being sent around. The city of Washington City, modern day Washington DC, has been relatively emptied at this point as far as its defenses. Right around 1864, it's probably one of the most heavily defended cities in the world. Shout out to our buddy Steve Fan down there at the Civil War Defenses of Washington. Tune into his page, uh, Civil War Defenses of Washington, uh, National Park Service page on Instagram and Facebook to follow along with all that action there because we're kind of going to hand it off, not directly right. to him officially, but it's <laughs> where our story ends is sort of where exactly where his story picks up. But the, the fortress situation down there is great when you have everybody staffing that fort but when grant decided to put his foot on the gas and start moving on the overland campaign and putting this pressure on lee one of the things he did was empty these forts out to bolster his you know campaigning strength so if there was ever a time to make a run on the most heavily defended city in the world it's right now right so it's like this perfect storm this perfect gamble and jubal early thought he was staring at an open road to a more or less undefeated undefended city uh, in an election year right. where they could have potentially done something as wild as captured the president of the United States. And all of this had a big wrench thrown into it by a bunch of really more or less inexperienced Union soldiers, 
supported by some really tough Union veterans. But this delay, this, this camping overnight and this slow movement the next day is literally the critical time that, that, that turns this overall, in my opinion, into a, a, a Union victory because the Confederate intentions are completely thwarted right. as a result of this time delay. And we will have, of course, the heat, the humidity, and the exhaustion of these Confederate troops coming into play on both the 10th and the 11th of July as they're moving ever southeastward heading for Washington. Uh, we're going to see a lot of stragglers. It's actually going to be one of the reasons why Early does not attack the defenses of Washington when he arrives around midday on the 11th. Yeah, he finds a city that not only has defended itself, but he finds his guys have been dragging feet along the way because they're worn out. Right. Throughout the, uh, the the day of the 10th, they have been moving through the lower parts of Frederick County into Montgomery County, right exactly through the area that I personally grew up in. They start to move through Gaithersburg and Rockville areas. Uh, for those of you who are Gaithersburg sort of aware, you know, sort of the layout of the city and things like that, if you know where Summit Hall is today, modern day um, recreational center, skate park, swimming pool, mini golf, it's right next to Gaithersburg High School. The the plantation house that, that was there at the time was the headquarters of Jubal Early just the day after this action. So you can see literally why 355 today is a main artery for mm. modern day commuters, but it has always been a kind of main artery for commuters. Certainly. And in this case, it was the Confederate Army trying to commute their way down to attack Washington City. And um, you know, like Matt was saying, though, but when they do arrive, they are worn out and, and they are facing a defended enemy. So this is one of my favorite stories of the American Civil War, because it's just imagine it like a high stakes poker game, except none of the players are sexy. You don't know any of these names unless you're really geeky, right? There's no Lee, there's no McClellan, there's no Grant, there's no Stonewall Jackson, he's gone. There's no uh, Longstreet, right? Things like that. Lou Wallace is arguably the most famous name that comes out of this battle, and he's famous for something he does after the war. Right. He wrote a little book you might have heard of. What's the name of this book, Matt? Ben-Hur. Ben-Hur, A Tale of Christ, made into movies Multiple, Multi, times. multiple times, most famously, I think, with Charlton Heston. Easily the most famous. Easily the most famous with that. So the guy that authored, authored that book, which became those epic movies, is in command of the Union force here, and he's in command of the Union force here because he's basically on a political list because, you know, how things unfolded um, two years prior right. in the Western Theater in Tennessee at the Battle of Shiloh, yep. which was, you know, one of Grant's moments. Um, so this is really cool. It connects a lot of a lot of dots it sort of frames the beginning of the long end of the war because right. at this point we're starting the front side of the twilight things are only moving towards the end at this point and as as the story for us ends the elements would turn over this i guess we would turn the story over to steve fan so we would ask you just go follow our good buddy steve fan over on the civil war defenses of washington because he'll be covering the 156th anniversary of the battle of fort stevens uh, over the next couple of days. And you'll actually see our good buddy here, Matt, show up in his professional setting uh, as a ranger. So uh, make sure you give them a follow. So Matt, I've had a really good time tonight. It was fun. Did you have fun getting out of the War Department? Oh, absolutely. It's always good to be in the field. Yeah, we're always kind of cramped up around the microphones, which is always a lot of fun. But if you've ever been in a recording studio, it's hot and sweaty. And if we're going to be hot and sweaty, we're going to get out in nature and see stuff, <laughs> especially battlefield walking. So anybody, or every, anyway, guys, um, for everybody here at the History Things Podcast, I'm Pat McGuire. This is Matt Borders. We thank you all for watching and uh, we'll see you again in a couple weeks. Have Thanks, guys. Are you ready?